Hello again, this is Mark Lance. I teach math and adult education program in New York City. I've been doing this for 22 years and I'm really committed to seeing my students get their high school diplomas and go on to better jobs, college, and satisfying careers. This is our, our first lesson and we're gonna be talking about fractions. Many of my students hate fractions, but I like them. There's a lot of math in fractions and they show up in a lot of places in everyday life in math and also on the GED test. For starters, what are fractions? They're numbers between the whole numbers. Here's a typical problem. So here we have a number line starting at zero and going up to five. And the question is, which of the following is the decimal point value of the dot on the line above? So here's our number line and here's the dot. And a question like this, this is right out of a uh, sample, a practice GED book, is something you might very likely see on the actual test. And even without being any kind of an expert on fractions, you could solve this just by using common sense and the math that you already know. So look at the information that they give us. Here's zero, one half, another number that's not identified, and one. So you could probably pretty easily figure out, again, like we said in the last uh, introductory video, Thinking about money sometimes help. So if this is a dollar and this is zero and this is a half dollar, I think you could be pretty confident in saying that this must be a quarter or if you were using decimals, 25%. If this is a half dollar and this is one, the same thing, three quarters. So we can see that each of these marks is going up by a fourth. Three fourths to one, one and one fourth, one and a half right on schedule one and three-fourths, two, and so forth. So assuming that these are all quarters, which looks like a pretty reasonable guess to me, if this is three, three and a quarter, three and one-half, what do you think that is? Take a minute and think. Three and three-quarters. We look down here, and again, even if you're not an expert in decimals and fractions, which we are going to talk about later, I think you'd be pretty confident in saying that it must be $3, 3.75 or $3.75 or three and three quarters dollars. So that gives you a, both, an, what I'm trying to get at is that what a fraction is, that if they're the numbers, they're, they're real numbers, they're numbers between the whole numbers. Okay. Um, a couple of terms that I want to talk about that we're going to be using a lot that you need to be familiar with. Um, first term is numerator. And in a fraction, that's the number on top. The number on the bottom is the denominator. So this, this term in a fraction tells what we're talking about, halves or quarters or eighths or whatever it is, and this figure is telling us how many of them we're talking about. So for an example, in the fraction three-fourths, the denominator is four, the numerator is three. As soon as you see that four, it tells you that this problem is all about fourths. How many of them? Three. I like to talk about pizzas. So here's a pizza that's divided into four slices. Since there's four slices and they're equal, each one of them is a fourth. This is one fourth of a pizza, this is one fourth of a pizza, and so forth. So we know that since we're talking, this pizza has four slices, we know that we're talking about fourths. How many slices are you having? Three, three fourths. The four refers to the number of slices in the pizza originally, no matter how many you eat, the three refers to how many you actually ordered. That's three-fourths of a pie. Okay? Uh, you can order more realistically. Most pizzas are cut up into eight, eight slices. Since there's eight slices, each one of them is an eighth of a pizza. That's eight slices, eight eighths when it comes out of the oven. And the numerator deter is determined by how many you have. You could have one slice, two slice, three slice, four slice, five slice. Five eighths would be 
five eighths of a pi, or if you keep into even more, six eighths, seven eighths, eight eighths, or one whole pi. Okay, so a fraction can be like this. It can be part of a whole, eight slices. You had three of them, so that's three eighths. A fraction can also be a probability, like when you're rolling dice, a die has six sides, and your favorite number is three, so you pick three. There's six sides. Only one of them is a three, so you have a one out of six chance of winning when you roll a die. Flipping a coin, a coin has two sides. If you call heads, a coin has two sides. Only one of them is heads. You have a one-half chance or a 50-50 chance or a 50% chance of winning, okay? All right. Um, <coughs> but in addition to being a fraction, it can sometimes be part of a whole. It can sometimes be a probability. But a fraction is always a division problem. A fraction is always a division problem, meaning that the numerator is being divided by the denominator. So the fraction 5 eighths means, oops, that's a different thing, 5 divided by 8. So you might say, well, that's impossible. 8 can't go into 5. Well, not all of it can go into 5, but 5 eighths of it can go in. Part of, it, part of this 8 can go into that 5. How much? 5 eighths of it. Okay, let's do some problems. And we'll start with a simple one. But um, so we have a problem. Let's say you have to multiply one eighth. I'm um, add. Sorry, one eighth plus three eighths. Well, we just saw from our pizza. If you had one slice and then you had three more slices, it's going to be a total of four slices. So this problem, both of these numbers are eighths. So we know this problem is about eighths, and now we're just going to find out how many eighths and how many eighths for a total of four eighths. That's all there is to it. Now, one thing I should mention is that fractions can have different names for the same value. So it won't surprise you if I say that four eighths, four slices out of eight in a pizza, is half of the pie. Okay, And this is called reducing. And Sometimes on the test, they'll say that even though this is the correct answer, 1 eighth plus 3 eighths is 4 eighths, but the instructions might say that all fractions have to be reduced to lowest terms. And how do you reduce a fraction to lowest terms? You look to see, is there some number that goes into both the numerator and the denominator? And that number is, the largest one is 4. 4 goes into 4 once, 4 goes into 8 twice, 4 eighths equals 1 half. That's what reducing is. If you didn't notice that it was that 4 went into it, maybe you notice that 2 goes, goes into both numbers. It still works, it's just an extra step. How many times does 2 go into that? Twice. How many times does 2 go into that? Four times. So 2 fourths is another name for 4 eighths, but it can still be reduced. 2 can go into that and that. So 2 goes into that once, 2 goes into that twice. 4 eighths, 2 fourths, and 1 half all have the same value, but this one is the lowest terms. Okay, let's do another problem. Incidentally, anything I put up here, if you need a moment to think about it and reflect, then just stop the tape and uh, see what your answer is to the problem, and then we can continue. You can always back up also. So the problem we just had one ace and three ace was easy because the denominator in both of the numbers was eight. But what if you had a problem where the denominators were different? So one-fourth plus two-thirds. Okay, so we can't add them directly because the denominators are different. It's like someone saying, how much is uh, three apples and four oranges? We need some common term like pieces of fruit in order to say that three apples and four oranges is seven pieces of fruit. And that's what we have to do here. Just like we saw before, that fractions can have different names. So we want to find another name. Well, that's supposed to be two-thirds. We want to find another name for each of these fractions that has the common denominator. Okay. Now, with these numbers, if you're just looking at it, 
you might be thinking, well, what, what number is it that both of these go into? Um, what about eight? Well, four goes into eight, but three doesn't go into eight. How about six? Three goes into six, but four doesn't go into six. So you might say to yourself, oh, 12. Bingo. Three goes into 12, and four goes into 12. One way to get a common denominator is to multiply these two numbers. Four times three is 12. It won't always be the lowest common denominator, but it will be a common denominator. However you do it, you think you realize that four, both four and three go into the number 12. So that tells us that our denominator is gonna be 12 for both of them, okay? Now we have to figure out the what the numerator is. So you ask yourself, what did you have, to, using multiplication, what did you have to do to that four to turn it into a 12? You multiplied it by three. The trick is, and it's not really a trick, it makes sense, whatever you do to the denominator, you must do to the numerator. So we're gonna, if we multiplied the four by three to get 12, then we must multiply the three also by three to get 12. Three times one is three, and indeed, if you reduce this, 3 twelfths reduces back to 1 fourth. We didn't make a mistake, okay? Now let's look at this one. What do you have to do to that 3 to get 12? You're going to multiply it by 4. 4 times 3 is 12. And whatever you do on the bottom, you're going to do on the top. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 twelfths. Now we're ready to add them. They have common denominators, so we can add them. The answer is still going to be 12s. This is saying 3 twelfths plus 8 twelfths. 8 plus 3, no matter what we're talking about, is 11. And there we go, 11 twelfths. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, let's do another one. How about a subtraction problem? How about if we have... The fractions 5 sevenths minus 2 thirds. We'll deal with the subtraction in a minute, but we have the same problem that we had a minute ago. We need to find a common denominator. Well, let's see. 14 doesn't work. 9 doesn't work. If we multiply 7 times 3, what do we get? 21. That's going to work. So we know that the denominator for this problem, for both of these fractions, is going to be 21. That's the common denominator for both of these fractions. What did we have to do to that 3 to get 21? Multiply by 7. What do we have to multiply? So if we multiply that by 7, we must multiply the numerator by 7. And that gives us 14. Same thing up here. What do we have to multiply the 7 by? By 3. 3 times 5 is 15. Did I make a mistake here? No, that's right. 15, 21 over 14, 21. Now we have a common denominator, and now we simply subtract. We know the answer is going to be 20, 21, 21st. 15 minus 14 is 1. Our answer is 1 over 21. Just one final thing. What gives us the right to do this? So we said that whatever you multiplied the denominator by, we're going to multiply the numerator by. And so that means we were multiplying it by 7 over 7. But if you remember that we said that all fractions are a division problem, this is saying 7 divided by 7, which is 1. So all we're doing is multiplying this number by 1. That's not going to change the value. It just changed the name to give us a common denominator so that we can do the subtraction, okay? Next time, we're going to take one step further, and we're going to be talking about so-called improper fractions. We'll do that in our next lesson. But I want to mention, as I did in the first one, a book that I wrote on the, uh, called The Weber House, featuring two 13-year-old girls set in Maine. It's a mystery, and they use science and math to solve the mystery. And you might like it, or your daughter, or your son, or grandchildren might like it, and I hope you'll check it out. Thanks.